what I'll talk about today is how do you capture information flow through networks on a massive scale. And um, if you think about um, how does information reach us as individuals, there are sort of, let's say, two ways how, how it can get to us, right? One is it can get through us pers through personal influence that is conveyed through our social networks. And the other way how information reaches us is it reaches us through influence by the mainstream media. So basically it reaches us through the mainstream media. And what is the interesting question to study then is to ask, okay, how does the information transmitted by the mass media interact with our personal social networks or personal influence that is arising from, the, from our personal social networks, right? And if you think about this, there is sort of this kind of tension between global effects that are arising from the mainstream media, sort of putting information on, on us, and the local effects that are being carried by the links uh, from our social network structure, right? And if, if these two effects, either, either one alone, were hard to capture in the past, um, today, today, um, sort of something different is happening, right? So what we have is we have this explosion of online and especially online social media. So and we have this at various levels or various scales, right? For example, we have every, all or mostly of, most of the traditional media, so mainstream media like TVs, newspapers, news agencies, they leave their trace on the web. We have uh, we have blogs, right? So both professional and personal blogs that again are there on the web. And we also have like microblogging, Twitter, right? So sort of this short, very quick, real-time uh, news updates, right? And this sort of span a very wide range from something very short and very quick to something more slow and traditional. So if you think about what kind of difference this makes, sort of blogs, inter um, um, and social media, how do they change this traditional picture about how we think about um, uh, media in all, right? So the first thing is that. Through the emergence of social media, this dichotomy, this, this global and local influence <coughs> is evaporating, right? So um, one reason for this is, for example, that the speed uh, that media is reporting uh, stories and discussions has intensified, right? Instead of sort of having this 24-hour news cycle, if you like, um, the speed at which we are consuming information to today has intensified. Another thing is that information today reaches us in sort of these small increments from real-time sources via, via social networks, right? Sort of Twitter feeds, RSS feeds, things like that, right? And the question then is, how should this change our understanding of information <coughs> consumption and um, the role of social networks uh, in this process? So um, what is the plan uh, for my talk today? I would like sort of to show you uh, how to analyze underlying mechanisms of real-time spread of information uh, the, the, through online networks. And in particular, I will focus on three different things. So the first question we'll be asking is, how do you track messages or information as it spreads on a global scale. Then, you then we'll be asking, how can you model predict the spread of uh, these kinds of information? And then the last question will be, can we identify networks? Can you infer these latent networks over which the information spreads? Right? Especially in the uh, mainstream media, the, the, way, the, way the, the way the information diffuses is through these implicit networks that are invisible to us. So the question will be, can we, can we infer them? Can we discover them? Okay, so um, I'll just start uh, with my plan, right? So in principle, right, because all these different kinds of media uh, leave traces on the web, we can sort of go and collect nearly or nearly complete uh, snapshot of that, right? And what we've been doing um, in my group at Stanford is that we've been collecting sort of an, an order of 20 million news articles per day since August 2010, right? So basically for, for every day, uh, since August 2008, we have you know tens of millions of units of documents, and this means we have 20,000 mainstream media news sources. Basically, everything that, for example, Google New Google News is indexing, and we are also following a bunch of different uh, blogs, forums. We have a uh, we also have a good snapshot of Twitter and so on, right? So we are having this huge data stream of uh, media activity on the web, right? And now, if I want to to track the information um, through, this, uh, through this stream of data. The question is, what are the basic units of information that I should follow, right? So what kind of pieces should I be able to identify that propagate between, let's say, these nodes of my networks? And these nodes can be users, can be media sites, can be blogs, and so on, right? And traditionally, these units have been, let's say, have been called memes, right? So they are sort of phrases of uh, short textual phrases. They can be quotes. They could be, for example, messages. Maybe hyperlinks are one such example or hashtags on Twitter that propagate, right? So um, what, would be, what would I like if I would want to extract such units? What kind of properties would I like them to have, right? And I would like sort of units of, let's say, text or units of information that corresponds, that really corresponds to real, ta real events, people, uh, places, and so on. I would like these things to be, to, to, um, 
to worry on a vary on an order of days, meaning I would like there to be some interesting temporal variability. And um, I would like this to be a, I would like to be able to handle this at a terabyte scale, right? I'm getting 50 gigabytes of stuff per day, right? And there are sort of two, two possible ways how to go about, uh, at least two possible ways how to go about this. So the first thing to use would be to see how hyperlinks are being formed between these different documents, right? So the idea is to, to trace hyperlinks through time and this way identify the flow of information. So the intuition here would be that there is some, let's say, some small obscure technological story that was posted somewhere on some blog. And then there, for example, there is some, you know, small technological blog that blogs about it and creates a hyperlink to, to my red story, right? And then some other media sites, let's say professional blogs, pick these things up and create links, hyperlinks to the, to the small technological blog, right? And then hopefully in, in, in this kind of example, BBC would write about this and actually point to slash dot where, which is where they discovered this piece of information, right? And if I, if I have, um, these uh, documents that are naturally stamped and they create hyperlinks between one another. Now I can trace hyperlinks in the reverse order and I identify this information cascade, right? So that would be sort of first way how I can study the diffusion on a global scale. Of course, the problem with this will be that um, m mainstream media sites don't link to one another. They don't contain hyperlinks. So there may be a different way to go about this. So one other way to go about tracing uh, the flow of information on a global scale is, for example, to think about, okay, I want to extract textual fragments that travel relatively unchanged uh, through many articles, right? And what, what, uh, what we did um, about a year and a half ago is um, to just say, okay, let's look at things that appear inside quotation marks, right? So let's extract quotes, okay? And perhaps, interestingly, right, we get about 1.25 quotes per document in our data set, right? So there is sort of more quotes than what you'd expect, or at least what I expected, right? So we get this uh, large number of quotes. And the first realization that, 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 uh, that you see is that actually these quotes, they mutate a lot, they change a lot. So what I'm showing you here, I'm showing you this uh, graph of approximate inclusion relations uh, from a particular quote from 2008 US presidential election campaign um, where uh, Sarah Palin was talking about uh, Barack Obama panning around with terrorists and so on, right? So there was this sort of long sentence she said, and here are all different sub variants and typos and things from it that, that emerged there on the web, right? And the first thing we need to do if we want to uh, be able to, um, to work with this data is to figure out, okay, what are all the mutational variants uh, of a quote, right? So how, how did the quote mutate? And the way we can approach this is through some kind of graph partitioning problem. So let me, let me try to explain to you what is, uh, what's the problem, right? So imagine that every node um, that here behind me um, is, a, is a quote and every letter is a word, right? So what I will do is now I, will, I have this set of nodes, set of quotes, and I will create these directed edges that will maintain, uh, that mean um, um, approximate inclusion relations, right? So this would say, aha, uh -huh, I as a quote could have, could have evolved from this potential pair. Right, so that's the intuition we'd like to capture. And then what, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, um, I would like to have a, an algorithm that would go and cut this graph in such a way that every connected component to this graph would have a single sync node, sort of the single grand, grand, uh, grand parent node. And um, I would like to do this in such a way that the, the minimal <laughs> total edge weight um, is deleted, right? So for example, in this particular case that I have, this would be the edges I would delete. This would be now my connected components. And the way I would sort of interpret this is that, um, is that all, all the quotes in, uh, in the cluster have a single, single grandparent quote from which they all have evolved. Yes? What is the meaning of the errors in this case? Uh -huh. That you are assuming that Approximate Exactly. So it's approximate inclusion relations. So what it boils down to is added, the string added distance, uh, or added right. distance at the le level Which of order. Yes. Right. So what I'm saying is I can only be included in a bigger. So that's why it's a graph. I always say I'm included in a bigger thing, right? I could have evolved by taking subset of the bigger thing and I became smaller. So that is the assumption. Yes. And then I allow smaller myself okay. to, no, to change no orders. You're not using the time I'm not using, I'm totally agnostic yeah. about time. Yes. Okay, so yes, so what I'm assuming is, right, this is sort of the grand grandparent from which everything evolved and everyone says, I could have evolved from this quote by having a small mutation. So we were really thinking about, you know, how, or our mental picture was how do genetic sequences evolve. So. I, I mean, one point is that a, a Portuguese changing a quote will make it longer and a Finnish changing a quote will make it shorter. So <laughs> that there is, the, I mean, you are making a strong assumption about I, I can I, I agree about that as as you'll see our data is heavily English biased so no no Portuguese people to mess up. 
Okay, so uh, good. So that's what I'll do, and here is here is what we go about this, right? So we take all the quotes that have at least four words and that appeared at least ten times uh, in our data set, right? So this was now three months before 2008 uh, US presidential election. This gives us a set of 22 million quotes, and when we do this dark partitioning that sort of no surprises empty hard, but there are effective heuristics that we develop, we get 35,000 non-trivial clusters, non-trivial connected components, right? And then the question is, you know, does this tell us anything? And here is sort of one way how to look at this data. So what I'm showing you here is this three months from August 1 to October, last day of October be before the US presidential election. And um, these, are, these are the volumes, right? So the y-axis is volume, x-axis is time, of different quote clusters uh, that we took. And I'm just plotting the top 50 largest ones, right? And if you remember um, that time period, um, then you will see that this sort of gives you a relatively accurate uh, picture of what was going on in the media before, bef uh, during the presidential race, right? You have the famous lipstick on a pig, and then you have fundamentals of our economy are, are strong and you know this was before and then everything was in danger and for example here is the last presidential debate on the TV and so on right so so all we did was we took this stream of documents extracted quotes clustered them and these kind of pictures popped to us what is also interesting here is that uh, overall the number of data the amount of data that we have is basically constant over time in some sense so modulo weekly periodicities the amount of stuff being pushed in the system is about constant but you still find this kind of synchronization events when um, most of the people or lots of people talk about the same thing and then the whole thing diverges and again converges again right so um, that's sort of the first realization the second realization is that you can make certain notions that we have about how the media space works now you can sort of measure and make them precise so for example one thing that you can do is to set is to measure that uh, on average blocks tend to trail mainstream media with a 2.5 hour lag right so if you if I take top 1,000 uh, uh, reported quotes and I ask what's the median lag between the peak of intensity of reporting this thing in mainstream media versus blogs, I find a 2.5 hour lag. If I go into more details, actually I find the picture is more interesting. So for example, what, what you see is that it's actually the professional blogs, so that's the, the, the figure on your, on your right, it's actually the professional blogs who are first that tend to report the story and then the attention sways towards the mainstream media and then get again back to the bloggers sort of personal bloggers right so the whole picture is much more much more interesting just than just saying there is this 2.5 hour lag and everything is over right so that's sort of one kind of analysis one kind of insight you can get you can get uh, you can get by doing this kind of analysis and for example we also work with uh, the Pew Center for in uh, Excellence in Journalism where we actually work with them about how the how the current economic crisis was covered and who were the main proponents and what kind of quotes appeared most on the web. So that's sort of the first thing. Um, second question is, as, as I showed you this, this graph before, uh, above before is, you know, what are the temporal patterns of information attention, right? So what makes, what makes, uh, what kind of shapes of popularity do we have there, uh, there on the web between these quotes or let's say on Twitter? So the way I will formalize this is the following. I will call an item to be a piece of information, let's say a quote, a URL, or a hashtag, and then I'll talk about the volume of that item over time, which is just number of times this item I was mentioned at particular or during particular time inter interval t. Right, so the way I can think about mo volume is the same as saying this is the number of mentions. I can think about this as some kind of notion of attention that item I got on the web, or I can talk about how popular this item I was. Right, but the way the way I quantify this is just to say what was the number of mentions of this piece of information uh, during a time step. Right, and what I would like to figure out now is what are the typical shapes of these uh, popularity curves. Right. And the way, I, the way I will formulate this is basically as a clustering problem, right? So the idea is that I have different, I, different pieces of information and what I'd like to figure out um, as, a, as I see their popularity over time is to say, aha, uh -huh, I have two, let's say in this simple example, I have two classes of shapes. I have this one with two spikes and one with sort of this one asymmetric spike, right? And if I would like to now design an algorithm that will, able, that will be able to allow me this, Basically, I need to do clustering of time, of, of time series that I had on previous slide, and I would like to find centroids, centers of these clusters, right? But I have a bit sort of um, interesting um, requirements here. So the, the distance, how I want to compare these different time series um, is a bit funny. So the first thing I would like to allow is I would like my distance metric to be invariant to scaling, right? So because I'm interested in shapes, I can take one time series, one popularity curve, scale it up, 
um, to obtain another one. And I would like the distance between these two um, xj and xy uh, to be 0. So that's sort of the first requirement. The second requirement, I also want invariance to translation. right? So I can take one time series, translate it along the temporal axis, and I would like uh, distance to be 0. right? So this is sort of two invariants that I would like my distance function to have. And um, you know, here is just the equation, but basically it's saying I want the distance between two time series is, is, is the minimal distance over all possible scaling and translation factors q here. right? And then I'm just taking Euclidean. And it turns out, the question then is, can I do clustering with such a funny distance metric? And it turns that I can do. And sort of the solution becomes the smallest uh, eigenvalue of a particular, um, a particular funny matrix. But one way or another, we can do clustering using um, this kind of distance metric. What's interesting then is to ask, OK, what kind of clusters do I get? So what I'm showing you here is, um, six, so the first thing is we figure out, that, or we find that there are six different shapes that this um, patterns this time series state. And here, here, here are these uh, six patterns for uh, one year of quotes on 107, uh, 170 million documents and um, 340 million different quotes. And interestingly, if you use, for example, Twitter data, we used a bit more than half a billion tweets and uh, uh, 8 million hashtags, the, temp the shapes of these patterns that you get are basically exactly the same. But here, I'm showing you the ones for quotes. And what I'm, so what do we see? First, there are six of them. Three have a single peak, and three have a bit more interesting peaks. And what, we also, what I'm also showing you here is that every square and every uh, little letter tells you when particular type of media tend to participate in, in, um, in, f in or tend to mention quotes that have a particular, um, that, uh, have a particular temporal pattern. Right? So sort of the, the number one is, the cluster number one is this average pattern where everyone is sort of um, said there at the same time, but then, for example, others are more interesting. So um, let me show you two, two, of the, two of the examples. Right? So for example, this kind of asymmetric, asymmetric peak with, where with very quick increase and sort of slower decrease is something that, is that, that, um, that sort of seems to be generated by news agencies like uh, Associated Press and Reuters. Right? Where basically, and um, what we also see in this case actually is that bloggers come late. Right? So bloggers mention phrases with this kind of pattern 1.3 uh, hours after the mainstream media does, and the, vo the, blo the volume coming from blogs is only like 30%. But then, for example, here's a, here's a different cluster, um, my cluster number six from before, where again we see a single spi spike, but sort of much, much longer, much, much longer uh, or much slower decay or much longer popularity of phrases. Here, actually, it's the bloggers who, who tend to mention these things first, right? Both they come first in time and also in volume. So the, the phrases with such pattern come mostly from the blogosphere. So the blogosphere gives you more than half of the mentions. And also, blogs are ahead of everyone else, right? So what seems to be, to be going here is that basically different media, depending on when they participate in the discourse, give ri rise to different um, temporal patterns that we see on the web. And what I'd like to do next is actually just take this idea and carry it a step, step further. Right? So I would like to be able to make predictions. So what I'd like to be able to say is, how much attention this will a piece of information get? Right? And the way I can think about this is the following. I can say, you know, here's my little hypothetical example, maybe about some Apple rumor or something. Right? So the question is, who, who reports the information and when? And um, the way I can think about this is the following. Right? I say, in sort of in the first hour, there are these three uh, technological websites that reported. And then in the second hour, it was the news agencies that came and reported this piece of information. And then you know, three hours in the third hour, it was New York Times and CNN. And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to say, OK, how many, how ad, how many other websites, blogs, uh, users will mention this piece of information? at hour four, at hour five, and so on. Right? So basically what I'd like to predict is how many people will get infected with this piece of information um, in the next time step. And the way I will be thinking about is, this is the following. Right? So what I'd like to, my motivating question is the following. If New, let's say, if New York Times, for example, mentions a particular piece of information at a particular time t, I'd like to quantify how many subsequent mentions of the information will this generate at the next time step, time step, two time steps later, and so on. Right? So um, this is what I'd like to capture. That capture. That's my intuition. Um, so what is my goal? My goal. My goal is to predict the future attention of of a particular piece of information. So here, what do I mean in particular is the future number of mentions of a particular um, information item. And the way how you can usually think about this kind of diffusion processes is to say, okay, I have a network. 
um, I have um, something spreading over the network. Um, I have these nodes that, that become infected with information and then can spread the information to their neighbors, right? Um, the problem here is that the network over which the information uh, spreads may be unknown, right? So the way, the way I, will, um, I will go about this is using the intuition we had from the six clusters uh, study is to say, okay, I will predict the future attention based on which nodes, which sites got infected in the past, which sites mentioned the information in the past, okay? So here is how I'll go about this. I will define, so the model, the, the model that I'll uh, build now is called linear influence model and everything will be about something that we will call influence functions, right? So the idea will be that every node has something that we will call an influence function associated with it. And the way this, what this influence function will do will basically, it will say how many nodes sort of after node U gets infected, how many other nodes tend to get infected Q hours or Q time steps later, right? So every, every, every uh, of these functions will, be, will tell me in aggregate when I, when after I get infected, how many other people tend to get infected after. Right, so for example, if you would say what, is the, what would be the influence function of CNN, you could say um, how many sites uh, would inf mention the information after they see it on C CNN, right? And then our question, our task would be how do we estimate these influence functions from the past data? And once I have the, um, once I have the influence functions of media sites I care about, then it's simple to predict the future volume. I will just say this is the sum of influences of uh, nodes of media sites infected in the past, okay? So um, here is, here's a pictorial way how to think about this, right? So we have this volume time series of an item uh, X, we have A, uh, which is a set of websites that mentioned a particular piece of information before time T. Um, then for every node, we will have this influence function that says how many, how many other nodes tend to get infected Q time units after you get infected. And then our prediction is, simi is simply we say the number of infected nodes at, or the number of mentions in, at uh, some future time step is the sum of the influences of everyone who got infected in the past and this needs to be appropriately aligned, right? So this is the time when node U first mentioned that information. So um, here's a picture, right? So what I'd like to do, I have time versus number of mentions of a particular item. I have the thread curve. What I'd like to predict is where this curve will be at the next time step. Um, imagine that I'm following three websites, so U, V, and W. For each one of them, I would like to estimate this kind of uh, what we call an influence function. And I would like to estimate these influence functions in such a way so that when I sum them up, they give me the, the, value, um, the value, the number of mentions in the future time step, right? So now our task will be, how do I figure out um, those curves and how should I model them? So the way we will think about this is the following, right? So if I just repeat, right? So our influence functions measure or try to quantify saying that after node U men mentions the information, UI, other, um, um, other nodes tend to, te or other nodes tend to get infected or um, uh, other mentions tend to occur a few hours later, right? So um, my influence functions are not observable. I need to estimate them from the data. The way I'll do this is I'll make basically no, no assumption about the parametric form of my blue curve up there. I will just model it as a vector of numbers. And the way I figure this out is basically set up some kind of least squares like problem, right? So I say, um, I go, I want to minimize this Euclidean error over all my, uh, all my items, over all my time steps. This is my prediction. This is the true value. Um, now the question is, how do I set um, elements of this vector uh, I, um, I sub u um, such that this error gets minimized, right? And you can see how sort of this looks like a simple least squares, least squares thing. And I can go solve this uh, on a large scale, okay? So the way I'll show you how, how, how well this thing works. So here's uh, my experimental setup. So what I'll do is I will take top 1,000 quotes by the total volume. So I'll take top 1,000 quotes that were most mentioned over a one-year period. Um, and um, overall, what, what we find is that these one, top 1,000 quotes, they, they, in total, they got mentioned 300, uh, 372,000 times on 16,000 different websites. <laughs> Okay, and then what I'll do is I will build, I will estimate these influence functions only for a hun for hundred websites, right? So the idea now is I want to predict the total number of mentions over a universe of over sixteen hundred websites with just observing mentions at hundred of them, right? So I'm building influence functions for hundred websites to be able to predict the pop uh, um, the, the attention of our population of sixteen thousand, right? Um, and the way, sort of, what are the baseline ways to do this would be to use um, some kind of standard time series uh, regression um, methods. 
And what turns out is the following, sort of when phrases have like are, very, are smooth, then our method works about the same as um, time series regression. But when we have bursty phrases, our method sort of works a factor of three better, and overall it works a, a factor of two better than what we were able to do before, right? So basically using this intuition that um, cites the man that mentions, uh, the number of mentions correlates with who mentioned uh, stuff in the past, we can relatively reliably predict how many, how much attention will something get in the future? Um, there's more we can sort of do with this model, right? Uh, these influence functions that we estimate also gives us, give us insight. So here is one thing that we can ask, right? We could say, uh-huh, after New York Times writes a post on politics, how many people tend to mention it, mention it in the next time unit, let's say next day, right? And answer to this question is exactly influence function of New York Times for political phrases, right? So what I'll do here is show you sort of a very brief uh, definitely not exhaustive example of how how these kind of things can be quantified, right? So what I'll have is uh, we manually labeled, um, uh, let's say, a handful of websites as newspapers, professional blogs, TV stations, news agencies, and sort of personal normal blogs, and we extracted six topics: politics, nation, entertainment, business, technology, and sports. Uh, the way we did this, we just looked at URLs. Um, usually in the URL of the article, there is one of these words um, for these uh, top level categories. And what we did then is for all the phrases from a particular topic or category, we estimated the average influence uh, for a particular media type, right? And then you can now plot what is the average influence function for a particular um, set of media from a particular category. And here I'm showing you sort of examples for two, two categories. One is politics, one is entertainment. And I'm cont contrasting sort of the effect of news agencies and, um, and, pers and personal blogs, right? And for example, you can see that news agencies are much more uh, influence influential at start about politics, but their influence very quickly decays. While, for example, for entertainment, um, it's the other way around, and the influence of blogs seem seems to persist uh, a while longer. But at the beginning, it's actually um, TV stations uh, and um, and news um, TV stations that are the most influential, for example, spreading the entertainment type quotes. Um, one thing that I haven't answered yet was sort of before when I started talking about this was the question: Okay, we don't have the network. How can we still make these predictions? So what I want to do the next thing is really to ask: Okay, but how does information really spread? Right. So so if I make an assumption that information spreads through the networks. What should these networks be? So here is, here is sort of the setting that we see, right? So we have this universe of, let's say, blogs or media sites, and we see the mentioned quotes, right? So this is basically what we see, right? There is a quote, there is a, there is a website that mentioned my blue quote, and then some other websites mentioned that particular same quote. And all we get to know is what is the quote and what is the time when they mentioned it. But what we don't get to see is the links through which, uh, by which this quote propagated through the web. Of course, if you make this assumption that, the stuff, that the, my quote propagated. Right? So basically the problem that I'd like to address next is we basically what we get to see is only the times when no, uh, nodes mention my quote, but I don't see the edges. I don't see the edges over which the information flowed. Right? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to reconstruct this hidden diffusion network, this hidden latent, uh, latent network. Right? And this is, uh, this is actually a much sort of broader, broader type of problem, right? So here are, there are at least two other applications where you could think about this, right? So basically the idea is that I have this network that I don't get to see. I have some process spreading over the network and by, uh, by seeing the result of that process, I would like to infer what's the underlying network, right? So for example, one case where I can uh, apply the same type of thinking is for disease or virus propagation, right? I have, so I have the network, I have a vi so the process that I observe is how the disease propagated through the network. What I got to see is when people get sick, what I don't get to see is who infected who. So the question is, based on the times when people get, get sick, can I infer the underlying social network? Or if I want to do, for example, word of mouth or viral marketing type studies, again, what, I, what is the process that I see is how recommendations uh, spread through this human social network. What I get to see is when people make purchases. What I don't get to see is who made recommendations to whom. Uh, the question is, can I infer this underlying um, social network? And um, just to sort of to, to say how, how we briefly, how we do it. So basically the assumption is that there is the net, the, a directed graph over, uh, over something, over which something propagates. I don't get to see the edges of this graph. I only s sort of know the nodes. And I only get to see the times when nodes get infected, right? So the idea is that there could be this 
ye yellow piece of information that spreads through my network in this particular pattern. And all I get to see is times when nodes got infected, right? And then I have some other maybe blue type of information that spreads through network in some other pattern. And again, all I get to see is times when nodes got infected. And then my question is, um, can I infer this who infected whom type of network? Um, the sad news is that, of course, this is MP hard. I mean, one way to see this is that what is the number of all possible graphs, right? It's 2 to the n squared. Um, that's a lot. That's like really a lot. It's like <laughs> scarily a lot, um, right? But um, here's the good news. We have an algorithm that can find the near optimal network in polynomial time, in squared time, right? So we can basically go and infer these networks with tens of thousands of nodes um, very quickly, okay? So um, let me, of course, I won't tell you how to do this. There's a paper, there are papers, but I'll tell you, I'll show you an example, right? So um, what I look, what we look at here, we'll look at uh, one year worth of data for uh, quotes. We have 172 million uh, news articles and blog posts over a one year period. We extracted um, 340 million different quotes. And for every website and every quote, we, uh, we recorded the time this t sub i of w when website w mentioned particular quote i, right? And now if I make an assumption that, um, that there is the network over which this quote is diffused, then um, the question is the following, right? So given the times when uh, sites tend to mention quotes, I want to infer the underlying diffusion network. So, and maybe my interpretation of this network, of the edges in this network would be that who tends to copy or who tends to follow whom, who tends to say things after whom, right? And you know, we can do this for, let's say here in this case, for uh, 5,000 websites. And um, blue dots are blogs, and red dots are mainstream media sites. And sort of it looks um, you know, interestingly complex. But actually, if you zoom in, you get to see interesting things. So here, is, here was the, the bigger thing. Here is now a small thing that we can actually look at. So what you get to see is that we find this kind of interesting topical clusters. right? So for example, here I have this you know, liberal blogs, uh, professional political blogs, right? And sort of Huffington Post is there in the center, right? Then another cluster that, that I see here is sort of um, entertainment, um, movies, gossip type of uh, sites, right? And then here at the bottom, it's um, geeky technological blogs, if you follow them, right? And what's interesting now is that um, I can start to, to see how do different websites, what kind of different roles do they play in this, in this network, right? So for example, I have Guardian sort of, or I have Huffington Post there embedded in this political part of space. I have Salon.com actually having connections to the, to the technical part of the space or Guardian to the, to the entertainment part of the space, right? So these are sort of kinds of things we can do by tracking this um, diffusion on, on a global scale. So um, just to conclude, and I think I was, I hope I was quick enough, um, sort of what was what, sort of what 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 I was trying to to present is a set of methods that allow us sort of to reason about messages that arrive through networks from real time sources, and that sort of this se new setting requires new ways of thinking about information dynamics and the way how we um, uh, consume information. I showed you sort of how track how to track information through implicit networks how to quantify temporal dynamics of these processes and the interaction between, let's say, blogs and mainstream media. We looked at this model of how to predict information diffusion and also how to infer these implicit networks uh, over which the information uh, can potentially flow. Um, just sort of what would be other interesting questions that I think. So one question is, you know, can this help us identify the dynamics of polarization? So in particular, how does information mutate? How does it change in different parts of the network? So for example, how does the attitude or sentiment of uh, change to a particular quote change in particular parts of the network? And also, how does the information itself, maybe how does it, uh, how does it change as it flows through, um, through uh, media networks? So I think that concludes my talk. Um, data and everything else is available at that, uh, those two URLs. I'll be very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Leskovic, for your brilliant and brief presentation. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and before uh, getting in, into some questions, I just want to make uh, a comment. It's not really a comment. It's uh, give some information maybe for your benefit or for the benefit of the audience. Um, the, the current issue of the journal Science have, um, is publishing a study by uh, one of our researchers at the Annenberg School that quantifies 
the entire set of information existing in the planet uh, with uh, analysis of the distribution by platform, by forms. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things which uh, shows the relevance of what we are trying to do here and what you are doing very uh, thoroughly, it's uh, uh, seven years ago, uh, the amount of digital, the proportion of digital information or the total information was 52%, now it's 94% of the entire set of information on the planet. So I think it could be an interesting uh, counterpart in purely quantitative terms uh, to the more analytical approach that we have here. Uh, Public questions? Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting talk, very stimulating also. I, in science, we are oftentimes interested to identify sources and sinks of uh, information, of knowledge, of expertise. We are especially also interested to see what kind of uh, institutions uh, create Nobel laureate people and where, where they retire, etc. cetera. Um, and it's interesting to see where those sources and things are. Are you planning to do this um, similarly, these kind of analysis? Um, so I th like that's excellent, right? So I think what's really the question here is, so the method which we use to sort of extract these pieces, right? Um, is very simple in some sense, right? Just track everything that's inside quotes, right? Which has its own biases that I don't think we understand too well, right? So um, the other thing that I like, you know, if you want to say who are the sources and who are things of information, I think the way, if, if we make an, an, an assumption that uh, stuff spreads through networks by, by analyzing the, let's say, positions or cent centrality, or I don't know how to say, of different nodes in these networks, we should be able to say, aha, uh -huh, who is seeing who is who's the source usually. So we could you know, identify some kind of ranking or topological sorting of these nodes through these, let's say, networks of how information spreads, right? So if we have one way, a way to track how stuff spreads, either through scientific literature or something, based on these uh, times of mentions and correlations, we can actually build these directed graphs and quantify these effects that you mentioned. So that's a good point. Oh, hi, I'm Ravindran from IIT Madras. I had a question about the influence function that you are uh -huh. modeling. And uh, in that, you actually ignore the context, right? So you just assume that this particular node is infected and how, how much, how many other nodes will get infected in the future. But the shapes of the graphs that they showed se seem to indicate that if the agencies come after the blocks, then their influence will follow a different pattern. Uh -huh. Uh, good point. So what I showed you is sort of the most simple version of the model that doesn't account for this, for all these kind of phrase-specific, topic-specific effects. But <coughs> it's very easy to throw these terms in. And actually, when we really do it, we throw in those terms. So it's a bit more complicated, but at the end, um, the, 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 the main ingredient of the model is still there, plus a few sort of phrase-specific or topic-specific terms that you can have. Uh, listen, there are five uh, persons who want to yeah. Uh, so you, I, I propose that we group the questions and then uh, you answer all of them together, but answering all of them. All okay. right. Right. So, uh, you still have space in your hard disk to I'll, I'll try store to put them on information. Yeah. So okay. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Sinan Aral from NYU. Hi, Yuri. Um, so we've had this discussion before, you and I, uh, and you use the word influence a lot uh, in this talk. So if we're looking at a, at a field with a bunch of people in it from a bird's eye view, and the one on the left-hand side opens up their umbrella, and then the one next to them opens up their umbrella, and all the way through the field, are we to assume that the first person influenced the next person, influenced the third person, or whether there's just sort of a rain shower passing over the field? And you know, more in your context, do East Coast bloggers influence, seem to influence West Coast bloggers more often than the other way around? I, I hope I was. Could you, could you yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah I, uh, I had a question about uh, hi, Shane Greenstein, uh, Northwestern. Just a question related, actually, exactly to that one about selection biases. So there's the old joke that uh, economists have correctly predicted nine of the last two recessions. And uh, <laughs> you know, you worry about that in, in what you're doing about the selection bias in uh, looking only at the propagations that occur. And so I wondered how you think about the one. You know, does it take a sex scandal at a university to get one of those things going? <laughs> say, or uh, as opposed to 
uh, you know, a something obscure at Congress, and then that there's a news story in the New York Times that it doesn't doesn't go anywhere. So it, okay, yeah, super. Uh, one uh, one. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know the question. Don't worry, yeah, yeah. don't worry. Uh, you are multitasking. It's no good. Uh, please, uh, Richard Rogers, uh, Media Studies, University of Amsterdam. Um, can we use your work as well to um, model blockages, non-spread, gatekeeping, all the sorts of things that? Um, we're interested in the media, uh, in media studies about. Uh, uh, the gatekeeper, the gatekeeping, Karim. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was trying to follow up. I'm doing the information variety project, and, and that's exactly what we were doing. And we found that blogs are basically influencing more than, than media. And we were looking at, at uh, political context. What was interesting in some of your uh, formula are that they were concentrated mainly on, as they said, as a very, as one influenced the other in the same impact versus looking at a power law. And we know that there is a very strong power law in the internet. And, and for example, you showed Huffington Post. Huffington Post was not Huffington Post three years ago, which means that if you're taking into account whoever was infected in the past, trying to predict op over that in the, in the present, a lot of things are happening real time. Look at, look at Tunisia, look at Egypt, look at, look at Libya. So th those are small examples. So the question is like, how are you taking into account two things, the dynamism of the internet, not by taking the past into account as predicting the future, but also the power law, very strong power Law distribution that exists there. And the last comment, Luis? Uh, these are very boring, very technical questions. The first one where you're doing clustering, yeah. you, you said that you're looking at translation and, uh, and uh, rescaling. Uh, what about stretching? Um, something that takes five days instead of two. Um, time is, like, to me, time is time. Like, time, like. Don't answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was order, sorry. Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, okay, okay. So first was no, I still don't. so si no, 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 oh, not yet. <laughs> okay, sorry. The other technical question is that you were trying to look at relationship who gave rise to whom, and um, there is a lot of work in biology in phylogenetic trees, and I was wondering if you using those techniques or if you were starting and doing something new. Okay. Uh, good. So, uh, uh, I answer, answer everything. Yeah, can I now answer everything? Uh, 42, but no right? 40 minutes. Okay. Oh, 40 no, 42 <laughs> is the answer. Uh, so, uh, so the first question was about sort of this influence. No, I definitely agree. So I hope what was sort of from this is at the level of correlations, right? I'm not saying people come to New York Times and then get influenced by New York Times, but I'm saying when New York Times tends to write about this, this many other mentions will occur, whether directly or indirectly, you know. So. This was at the level at the level of uh, prediction. So I agree that you know, and I like I, I think at least at one place, yeah. Um, let's say you know, this many other people tend to mention, um, and I can make this sort of this high level uh, predictions. I do them, uh, so then I'll answer that question um, about uh, heavy tails and things like that, right? So so um, yes, um, in the model right now we ignore sort of the temporal. How to say? We ignore the dynamics of the sides themselves, right? We are making predictions per phrase, but because of these heavy tails, right? Um, I think the reason why we can do well, why we can predict well for a population of 16,000, given that we are only modeling 100 of the sides, is because there are these big powerhouses there, right? So I think that's the, that's also the reason why we are able to make accurate prediction for a large population by just m modeling or observing 100 websites, right? So the task I was doing was predict the future number of mentions of a particular, <coughs> of a particular phrase, particular um, text quote, um, by observing which of the 100 websites mentioned and when, and, my, and I wanted to predict the total number of mentions over 16,000 websites. So that was one. Um, there was the question about, yes, um, what prop sort of what propagates and what doesn't. So yes, so in some sense, I agree with that, that what we were doing right now is we took things that at least got some traction, right? We sort of took the, the more popular things, even though there was lots of variation in the total number of mentions of those things, but we still, we took things that at least ha got a bit of fire. So, um, and you know, 90, 90 per, or you know, a large fraction of other things don't even, don't even do anything, right? So um, the question of will this propagate or not, I don't know how to answer this. So actually we are looking now um, we are working with Twitter. Uh, we have access to everything they have, and that's one of the things we want to look at: is you know, will this go off or not? Um, um, was that all? Did I forget? 
Oh, there was here one more. Okay. Or I'll be happy to answer questions later about clustering. Okay. Thanks a lot. Oh, sorry.